Good morning, and welcome to Tuesday with Lois. This is Anya He, your host. It has been exciting few weeks as we have been showcasing innovation at Lois, and today we have a special group of experts who have been on the cutting edge of reputational risk and who has been also pushing the limit and the boundaries in creating solutions for our clients. Without going into further detail, which they will introduce themselves in a minute, I want to just give you a few housekeeping items to remind you. For one, we want to encourage you guys to be interactive. So please ask questions using the Q&A tool on your screen. And secondly, the session will be recorded. Uh, if you have colleagues who are unable to join us today, please share with them the video afterwards. So without further ado, please welcome Tina Kirby. Thank you, Anya, and thank you all for tuning in, which I hope will be an interesting session and it will be made more interesting by you all being um, very active in asking questions of our experts. But let me just explain what we're doing. So the first session here is uh, intended to be one of a few around reputation risk. We're going to begin today with why now is the time to focus on uh, reputation risk. And that later sessions will go on to focus in more depth on the management, the measurement, the mitigation, and the monitoring of reputation risk, all of which present very different significant challenges. Now, reputation risk regularly features in the top 10 of corporate risks alongside other complex issues like financial risks or strategic risks, carbon transition risk, and recently pandemic risk. And none of them are very well served by the risk transfer industry at present. But reputation stands out as an area where underwriters have put a considerable amount of time and resource into the construction of viable risk transfer mechanisms. So is now the moment for non-damage risks like reputation to finally get the attention they deserve? I've got three experts with me today to help answer that question and any of the others that you, the audience, want to put to them. Firstly, Neil Kempston from Beasley. Can you take a moment to explain who you are? Hello everyone and thanks for joining us. So I'm Neil Kempston, I work at Beasley. Um, my role is an incubation underwriter, which is a fairly strange title, but the key principle of what I do and what my team does is to discover, design, uh, develop and underwrite brand new insurance propositions. Um, this year I've been primarily focused on working with brokers and clients underwriting our Beasley reputational risk solution, which we launched in February of this year. Thanks, Neil. And then Tom Hode from Tokyo Marine Kill. Sorry, struggling to come off mute. Um, Tom Hode, uh, Tokyo Marine Kiln. I am head of innovation. Um, I am very lucky in that I have various tools to use to help uh, the group innovate, including a risk incubator, uh, R&D resources, access to the, the sort of wide array of lots of different talent hidden away in the Tokyo Marine Group globally. Um, and this particular subject is something that I've been working on for over a decade. So keen to chat with my fellow panelists. Thanks, Tom. And from over your side of the pond, Harry Rulin from Crisis Risk. Well, thank you, Tina. And I would say good morning to all of you, but I think for a bunch of you, it's probably afternoon. Um, <laughs> I am the CEO of Crisis Risk, which is a uh, Beasley strategic partner, uh, works with many Lloyd syndicates, works with uh, many US-based insurers, uh, we are a program improvement firm, and we utilize risk management and crisis management tools in order to do that. Um, so I've been lucky. I've spent my entire life in the insurance industry. I was born to an insurance family, so some of you may recognize the Rulin name, um, three generations of Lloyd's members. So I am happy to be on this call with all of you. And of course, I've worked with many of you before, so I look forward to doing more of that. Thanks, Harry. And we're going to hear more from you and that heritage. But first, let's go, go back and um, make sure that we're all talking the same language. So what is the difference between brand and marketing and reputation? So I've heard it said that brand is like the sun, the source of all light and warmth in life. And marketing is like the moon. So it's a pattern of methods and tools that reflect the sun's light and promote the business. How does that sound to you, Neil? Does it ring true? And therefore, what is reputation? I like that analogy. It's sort of a good way to think about it that we often often don't. So I quite like that. You know, that's really good. Um, in sort of a, a high level, really, marketing is is 
it's the techniques that um, a, a company or an organization uses to sort of put the message that they want to put out out there into the into the ether. Brand is something that can be sort of designed, built, shaped, and owned. It's the image you strive to put out. But reputation is all around perception. So it's how your organization uh, is perceived, how credible your message is, um, and it's used uh, mainly through you know the interpretation of direct customers of a business. Having a more connected world now than we ever have before, uh, it's a much broader group than ever it used to be. It used to be primarily the buyers uh, or the you know the people who interact directly as a customer of your organization. Um, however, now it could be anyone. There are thousands upon thousands upon millions of super producers walking the street with one of these that's able to get a message out about an organization much quicker and much deeper than ever before. Thank you, Neil. So Harry, start us off with why now? From your perspective as a practitioner in the past as a broker, family, and, and now as a crisis manager to deal with various different situations. Why is now the, the right time from your view? Well, you know, one of the great things about Lloyd's and, and about the specialty insurance industry is that it adapts very quickly to the changing risk environment. And I think that Neil just hit it on the head. I mean, when he held up you know, his smartphone, now the ability for a brand or a reputation to be built or destroyed in a very short period of time um, is different than it's ever been before. Um, I turned 58 last week. Yes, thank you very much. Happy birthday. Uh, but I've had the great joy to have lived through the technological revolution. Um, you know, some of our grandparents lived through the Industrial Revolution, which was a gigantic change and required huge changes in the insurance industry. Um, and I think the technological revolution is the same way. I mean, before people had cell phones and computers and tablets and all these different things, you know, when there was a reputational event, it took place in a very narrow area. It was very confined. Now, in today's world, it can go viral and literally be worldwide in a matter of minutes. So I think very much, it was interesting when you were talking about the difference between branding and marketing uh, and reputation. I think most organizations are very comfortable with marketing because it's an operational function and they're doing that every day. But building brand and preserving reputation is just not something most organizations are focused on or have the skill set to do. And I think that's where this specialty product is necessary for every organization that has any kind of a public facing uh, attribute to its brand or what it's doing. And I think that it's just a necessary product now in today's world. So would you say you need a different skill set to build a reputation than to defend a reputation? Very much so. Very much so. I think that the, the monitoring that's necessary to defend a reputation, the monitoring that's necessary to understand what's going on and how it's changing day to day. You know, one of the things that we do when we analyze how these uh, brand events are moving, we look at the spread speed and setting. And, you know, so how fast is it really moving around the world or within your customer group? And what is the setting in which that's being done? You know, if it's in a local newspaper, it's one thing. If it's being done, you know, on Twitter or on Facebook and it's reaching millions of people very quickly, that's very different. So again, most organizations don't know to even look for those things, no less how to do them once they, once they find that area. So most people won't have this, this skill set in-house and, and maybe that makes it hard for them to know what they need. So why, why now for brokers? Why should brokers be looking to bring this subject up with their clients? And in a minute, I'm going to ask Neil and Tom whether that's completely the wrong way around. And in fact, the clients are bringing it up with their brokers. But firstly, Harry, from a broker perspective, what would be the incentive for brokers for now? But it's interesting. You know, it's, it's a great question because one of the things that we as brokers were always looking for was what I call a sword and a shield. In other words, we were looking for a sword to be able to go out and battle to bring in business, to take business from our competitors, and similarly, a shield to be able to protect 
other brokers from taking our business. Well, be sure that if one of your customers, one of your insureds has had a brand event where their reputation has been damaged and you haven't done the things that are necessary to help protect them, they're going to be unhappy about that to begin with. But similarly, you're going to, if you're not offering these products to your insureds, someone else is going to. And if they offer the reputation product to your insured and manage to get what I call the thin edge of the wedge, if they use that to set the thin edge of the wedge and they start tapping away at that wedge, they're going to start looking at their other other coverages as well, their property and their liability and their other things. So I think very much um, brokers need to get educated in how these products work, what they are, why they're meaningful to their insureds and be able to use it, as, as I said, both as a sword and a shield. Not all company, not all of the broker's clients uh, are going to be in a position to protect their reputation. So how do you tell the difference between those complacent, compliant, and committed clients? I love those three Cs that you use. Maybe explain those. Well, yeah, I think when you're looking at risk management in general, um, there are different types of organizations. And as you said, some of them are complacent. They don't believe, essentially, what we hear in almost every crisis that we assist and insured with is, we never thought it would happen to us. And that's a complacent kind of attitude that unfortunately leads to a lot of problems. Then you have those that exist, many of our healthcare clients, for example, exist in a world where they have to comply. They have a compliance obligation. So the planning, the training, the things that they're doing are not being done because they truly believe that they need to do it, but because they have to comply. And then, of course, you do have committed organizations that very much understand the reason and the need to do these things. So when you look, for example, at consumer products companies, um, you know they understand their obligations, their recall obligations, all of those things. And and many of them have a commitment to protecting their brand and reputation. So I think that those three C's are very important to look at. But I don't think from a broker standpoint that you need to um, assume that the complacent organizations are not going to buy this coverage. I think that a lot of them will once they understand why it's a necessary coverage and that why having this coverage in place makes such a big difference because you need it there before, during, and after an event um, to have the, the best outcome. So I think very much, and it, it really doesn't matter whether you know, you're talking about healthcare, consumer products, uh, energy clients, I mean, schools, higher education. This is a product that works in almost every type of organization that I can think of. Well, let me then throw that challenge over to you, Tom. Um, how do you see the clients assessing that risk? So whether they are in uh, any of the sectors that Harry talked about, um, how do they know that they have a risk, to what degree that risk is important to them, and set that appetite so that they can then come to you for some solutions? Yeah, so, I mean, I think coming to me for solutions is probably the very end of quite a long process often, actually. Um, but I think in the first instance, what tends to happen is that companies tend to be quite heavily concerned with managing the communications and information about the strengths and weaknesses of any one company. And, and companies are a bit like an organism. And within certain companies, what you end up with is this um, sort of interesting development is called Brooks Law, where you go from having so there's three points of communication which have three different lines between them. And that's quite easy to control. And if you see that as a company, then you've probably got three people inside a company who probably know each other very well and could communicate with each other in an extremely effective way, a very open way, and to know all the skeletons in the closet or other things they're doing. And as a people person, I believe that people generally trying to do the right thing. Now, as you scale from a three-person model to more like a 50-person model, it's not 50 lines that represents the lines of communication. It's a hell of a lot more. And when you think about the context of that with the ways by which companies interact with the world or whether or not they interact with, um, for example, suppliers, customers, the whole world of things sort of explodes. And suddenly all those kind of communication lines suddenly become quite a difficult thicket of different things to manage. Now, 
in today's world, as I think Harry quite rightly pointed out earlier, and I think Neil probably touched on it as well, you know, we're now dealing with managing companies that have this huge complexity associated with them to which the sort of vulnerability is a bit like the same as a, like a pumice stone, you know, with the, the porosity of different things that can leak out from the core business and that that can then cause a problem on the, on the wild west of the internet. So, so that's the sort of starting point, I think, in a lot of these executive rooms. And, and then through that, obviously organizations align themselves through systems and processes to kind of govern that. And so they try and put some form of governance framework around it to champion their true values and, and other bits and pieces. Now, what then tends to happen, and I, I want to let Neil speak because he's live out in the market with, with product for this, but what then tends to happen is that um, you, you then probably go through a series of near misses where it's likely that either a competitor or yourself has suffered some form of you know, near miss that actually gets attention back with the board. Now that tends to go back into, well, how do we govern this? And then, I mean, what I've seen over the last 10 years is that companies really are now looking to some of this metrics and data to define really like how volatile they are as, as a company, what happens when things go wrong and what information needs to go to what part of their organizational process and values to describe how to their range of publics on, in the amazing world of the internet and everything else, how they actually respond to things going wrong. And that is honestly very complicated. So um, I think it's only when you've understood that or understood a component of that, that then insurance really kind of applies or works particularly well. But as I said, I probably ought to let Neil speak on that if he wants to comment. Yeah, so Neil, I think that he's, he's talked a bit about the complexity of it. Can we make it simpler? Can we say that there is a KPI in the, or a number of them? That, that a client can use because it doesn't feel like benchmarking is the right method here because if I know that I'm as good as anyone else that's no no help when my reputation is lost uh, it's it's got to be good protection uh, and we've got to understand the indicators of problems um, but how do you simplify that complexity that Tom just explained I think it's uh, obviously it's a bit of an amorphous topic reputation as, as we all know um it's, it's always been a sort of a, a, an important factor, but much more important than ever before. I mean, the types of organizations that, that we speak to on a regular basis, it's either in the top 10 or top three or even number one on their um, risk register. But I think the, the crucial thing is that reputation means a lot of different things to a lot of different organizations. So in some spaces, in some industries, you're more concerned about the regulatory license, you know, uh, fines issues. In some, it's more around investor sentiment. It's some, it could be loss or uh, loss of access to specific talent. Um, but I think in, in some of the organizations that we deal with, that we work with closely, which is aligned to how our, our product works, is looking around that loss of attraction. So what's driving that, that change of consumer sentiment that's having a knock on to your business? Now, it's quite a simplistic way to think about it. But as a measure of the impact of a crisis, it's a way that will really make it clear to a company of how it will affect them. So the first thing that will happen is your revenue will drop. Um, to, to, to Tom's really good point around the near misses, a lot of the perils in reputation are well-known and well-established. So the, the example that, that, that we like to give is there's a theme park operator has an injury on a, on a roller coaster. So you know there's a crash or someone falls out, that sort of thing. You've got insurance in place for things like the liability following the injurious uh, activity. You've got property insurance, which will cover for damage or for a small amount of the business instruction until the thing's up and running and ready to go. At that point, they're less interested. Now, what happens is you'll have a huge loss of attraction in terms of people no longer coming to your park and the rest of your park because of the safety implication and the concern around that. So that's the perception rather than the reality. All the other rides are safe and they've, they've been proven safe and they'll all have been rigorously tested following this accident. But the perception is, is what, what will happen. Now, the direct impact of that is to sales, to ticket sales. So there, there are certain ways to look at it. It does, like I say, differ by industry. Um, but there are ways to, to sort of start to comprehend it. So I was, um, I was once involved in an argument about whose fault it was. So who, who in that example was the person who made the error? Was it the operator who was running 
the, the, the theme park or was it the CEO? Because ultimately he, the buck stops there. Uh, and that argument raged round and round. And, and Harry, is there a succinct answer to um, what it does clear management of reputation help when there is a crisis and, and or mitigate um, before as well as afterwards the scale of that crisis? Well, it's so interesting, the question that you just asked and the way that you asked it, because um, you mentioned the CEO. And uh, when Neil was talking, you know, he talked about different types of perception um, of reputation. One of the things that you deal with when you're a broker and you're selling a product, let's say you're you're selling DNO, you're dealing with directors and officers who each have their own individual brand and reputation, you know, and a lot of them are concerned about that in the process where they're on the board or they're an officer in a company where some type of reputational event happens, you know, and, and Neil mentioned um, the various different kinds of peril. Um, I wrote an article a few years ago that you guys may remember that was called Crisis as a Peril. You don't necessarily have to have a fire, an explosion, a, a theme park a ride. You can have a crisis for no reason, not necessarily no reason at all. But I mean, with hashtag me too, with Black Lives Matter, with a lot of the things that we've been dealing with, organizations have found themselves in crisis where they didn't have an actual event on their premises. You may recall a few years back, um, there was a hospital that lost 50% of its emergency room revenue because they admitted a patient who had Ebola. And it was not a problem. Patient, you know, was in there. It was in quarantine. It was no big deal. But the loss of attraction because of the what took place on the Internet destroyed the revenue stream for that organization. So it's very complex. And again, this is not something that a normal organization, a CEO or anyone else, they don't have the skills, the knowledge, the ability to foresee these things and therefore plan for them. And again, I think that brings full circle back to why this product is so meaningful, because it brings you expertise before the event ever occurs. It helps you to prepare for that. It helps you to understand what you're going to do when the event actually uh, does occur. And very often, I think that the, pr the product is going to be uh, engaged before you even know the scope of what's going to ultimately occur. So, so are you saying that most companies actually can't manage a reputation crisis? So although I'm asking the question, can it be managed and who should be managing it day to day? What you're saying is actually don't try because it's a skill set you won't have internally, 99%, and that you need some external help? I think, well, so... No to the first part of what you're saying. In other words, I think they should be trying, planning, all that. But yes to the fact that you're going to need external help. It's just not going to be, well, you're not going to want to hire the staff that it would take to do it. And it wouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't necessarily be at a best practices level, even if you attempted to do that. It wouldn't make any sense. In the same way that it doesn't make sense for you to try and bring in house all the skill sets that your insurers bring to you in many specialty area areas, whether it's kidnap and ransom, deadly weapons, whatever it might be. Um, those are skill sets, again, that you're not going to have the expertise in-house to complete your planning, training, and education process. Go on, yeah. Tom. Say something. Sorry, just, just sort of jump in. It's, it's interesting. I mean, I think, you know, for, for a long time, I've actually worked as, a, as an insurer, as a carrier, uh, with a company called Steel City Re. Now, I met a chap called Dr. Nir Kozowski probably eight years ago now. Now, he, he would probably reliably inform me that you know, reputation premium, as in the positive effect of reputation, it is probably the biggest asset that well-governed companies actually have. And, and so I think, to Harry's point, that actually some of, some of this logic is about looking at the way by, com by which companies kind of evaluate themselves, like Steel City Re would do, and, and then almost having options to sort of ensure, manage and, and almost arbitrage the kind of the, the way that the risk 
relates to that positive value. And, and what I've seen over the years is that companies that really get that, they kind of, they kind of curate this, this sort of reputational resilience that's founded on the, the kind of brand equity, reputational equity in a, in a company. And so I, I think part of the, the solution is to, is to almost put those positive metrics and, and methodologies in reverse but to be able to capture them against the way that the business sees and evaluates that value. Now that's quite complicated still. So I still think it needs you start in house and, and then start bringing in third parties. But I really do think there is a, a, a value there that, that a lot of the best companies, the best and the best well governed companies as well. I think think about ESG. I think that the reason why you promote ESG is not to tick a box. It is to genuinely create a reputational brand above and beyond your competitors for the right reason. Neil, how do you feel about that and, and that monitoring that can be done or can be uh, bought in? No, uh, it's, it, it's really good points. And I think um, to, go, to go back a little bit, the, to sort of go back to what I started off with when we were talking about the definitions of, of brand and marketing and, and, and reputation, a lot of the, the key uh, element that we've seen with some of the organisations we work with is the the ownership and the identification and the difference between that brand and marketing and crisis management and and Harry can talk to this much better than I can but around that sort of uh, battle scarred uh, in in fighting sort of um, approach when you're actually in in the process which is very different to business as usual um, so I think that's a key part in terms of monitoring there's lots of systems out there Tom's touched on um, one of the solutions out there with Steel City Re. Um, a key stat that, that that we like to talk to, um, and I'm sure others do, is that up to 90% of companies report having inadequate access to data to manage their reputation. So there are some mechanisms out there, um, have been out there for a bit, but they're more focused on the marketing side of things. So that outwards approach, measuring the success of those, and that's just sort of typical social media monitoring systems. Um, Tom mentioned the one um, with Still City Re that uses a series of indices um, based on several different factors to measure the change in reputation. Um, but there's one that we use uh, and we work with a company called Polcat. Um, Polcat's a, a company that's not an insure tech. It's been in, in play for over 10 years. It's set up by um, some very senior people from, from Microsoft. What they have is an AI driven um, system that uses a combination of natural language processing and machine learning to identify all the different characteristics and uh, you know where a brand or a company is mentioned anywhere in the digital media space. So that's across social and the sort of the online press. Now, what, what it does with that, it, it, it creates a score. Now we talk around sort of measuring and monitoring using this score, which they call impact, which assesses the, uh, the credibility, reach and relevance of articles to that brand. So you know, is a company being named specifically um, are they, you know, further down the article? Is it in combination with lots of different companies? That way you can identify the sort of the depth and the damage, um, you know, to Harry's three C's earlier, the, the, the challenge that might be, that might be there. Um, crucially for, for us and as an insurer, but also for our clients as, as, you know, bringing that risk management into place, um, it allows them to see issues before they occur. So they can pick up the near misses that might be affecting their competitors, but they can also start to identify an issue before it explodes. So they can bring expertise into play, typically external expertise, um, to help solve an issue before it becomes dramatically big. So monitoring is, is a key thing that's now starting to become um, available in a way that can react to the, the breadth and the broadness of the internet um, in a way that you can understand issues. Um, a, a, sort of a quick example of, of where we've seen success with that um, we worked with a, a US-based company. Um, with the technology, we were able to ping, pinpoint uh, an upcoming anti-mask protest at a specific store location before the event actually occurred based on online chatter. And then they could take mitigating action both online and physically. Yeah, in the meeting, they're like, we've got to go, got to go make a phone call. Um, <laughs> so it's quite interesting. I'll tell, I'll tell you the other thing. The other thing that's really good about you know, that sort of structure is that, you know, the internet is a bit like the Wild West and you have click farms, content farms, controversy that 
isn't controversy. You have, you know, sentiment, all sorts of stuff. And what I think is becoming more sophisticated as well is the accuracy by which some of that AI can actually search and seek out some of those things that otherwise have nothing to do with the company or, or that have just come from an inappropriately placed ad that the company released on the internet that happens to be next to a picture of something that the company would never want to be associated with. And, and I, I think one of the things that's coming across, and, and I'm a massive advocate, by the way, and just in case anyone didn't realise, for a, a, a range of um, solutions in this area, because I think that you know, whilst we support the Beasley product and it's great and we support the Steel City Re product and it's great and Liberty as well, but you know, I think there are a, a numerous different potential applications of insurance to, to this sort of world. Um, and I think coming back to the nub of it, like some of the things that it's really interesting hearing Harry speak about, because I, I, I mean, from a personal standpoint, I think he's third generation. And in terms of his sort of ability to navigate the market and, and, and really help clients, I think it's, it's very good to hear um, from Harry that, that actually, you know, in, in this world, that products like the Beasley one, are actually now really getting some level of traction. And, and, it, and it may well be that they need flexing and changing and adapting over time. But I, I know this from personal experience. I mean, I've been trying to sell reputational risk insurance in some way, shape or form a, as a complement to client risk for a long time. And I can tell you that what we started with is not where we are now, but we, we are pioneering the R&D behind this. And when we are looking for partnerships for, to, to, to uncover how to unlock specific strands of this in numerous different ways. And I, I just think it's quite refreshing that whilst it's a kind of a well-trodden subject, I think we're here today because there really is a momentum now behind some of this. And, and I just think that's a good, good, good attribute to have in the conversation. Is there enough capacity now? Because one of the issues around measuring what the value is, is then deciding what I need to purchase might exceed what the capacity well, is. Well, I want to jump in on that, but I'm very at risk here of getting on my little hobby horse and, and riding around the screen if we're not careful. Um, but um, so one of the things that you might not know is that um, Lloyd's made quite a big decision last year um, so as to accommodate innovation generally in the marketplace by allowing 2% of Lloyd's stamp. So that's 2% of the total premium planned for Lloyd's for 2021. Um, to be allocatable by every syndicate to be used for innovation purposes. Now, at Lloyd's level, that creates a potential premium pot of £700 million to be used for promoting and supporting innovation products. Now, to my mind, that is Lloyd's doing what Lloyd's is best at, a beautiful artisanal set of different syndicates and talent coming together to solve client problems. Now, I think... I think that, and I'm, I'm happy to be quiet for a second because I think Harry wants to speak, but, but I, I do think that, that that sort of approach taken by Lloyds, coupled with this kind of, and I'm right in the thick of it, so I can tell you hand on heart, this kind of cottage industry, um, entrepreneurial um, heart of Lloyds that's being built around um, the Lloyd's Lab and that innovation ecosystem, I can tell you, is, is genuinely moving the needle on this, at least from a capacity standpoint. And one of the things that that's building is, is a sort of a genuine ecosystem around subject matter like this. Now, again, I can quite easily go on about this for hours, so I'm going to be quiet. But one last thing I'll leave you with is that in that ecosystem, like that ecosystem needs fuel. And it needs a range of different talent to interact with it and engage with it, whether it's Harry and his perspective, whether it's an insure tech and the new data set or, or, or technological advance that we can use or whatever it is. And maybe it's actually clients saying, hey, let's start again with a blank piece of paper. What should we do? This is what we need. You know, that's the sort of vibe that I think is coming from London at the moment. And, and I think that that is a huge catalyst for the way the market's going to evolve, not just next year, but for, for decades to come. 
So anyway, I'd better be quiet now, otherwise I'm not wasting time. You do, do. Shut up. That's far too much. Yeah. So, <laughs> Sorry. Um, Harry, if you'd want to jump in there, make it um, succinct, because I do want to hear from Neil, you know, in practice, what kind of clients are you actually seeing now? But Harry, jump in. Um, actually, I was very interested in what Tom was saying, and I wasn't going to jump in, but I will for one second, because I can't comment on capacity. But going back to what he was saying about the changes that take place continuously, I think the rate of change is something that only Lloyd's and Beasley, the type of firms that are entrepreneurial, that are able to allocate resources to innovation, they're the only ones who are going to be able to respond to this because, as Tom said, that internet is the Wild West. It evolves so rapidly. The rate of change is probably the biggest risk that all insureds have because things change so rapidly. So I think this group is uh, pointing out exactly, I think, what the brokers need to be pointing out when they're going to meet with their insureds, Mm -hmm. that even if you have a brand and reputation program in place, you still need these tools and these skills because you can't keep up with the rate of change. So before Neil um, tells us what he's seeing, um, and after that, we're going to stop for some questions from the audience. I just want to let you know that there are a question out on the poll, which is around um, the measurement, management, mitigation, and monitoring topics that we've really lightly touched on here. Um, And please answer that to give us your view on uh, on the question mm-hmm. itself, and then we'll follow up that question um, with uh, another around, um, would you, following this and further discussion, would you, if you had spare uh, budget, would you spend it on reputation risk, or is it on one of the other, other risks that are on that list? So Neil, uh, what sort of clients are you seeing at this point in time, and, and is it is it a sea change? Are you seeing clients coming in because they're seeing new capacity and new simpler solutions? And is your solution going to be the one answer or is Tom right? Are there lots of different ways? Lots of I mean, obviously, obviously, Tom is right. Uh, Tom is always right. So um, I, I think I made a point earlier around um, the point that, that reputation means different things to different organizations. So the solution that Beasley's put together is specifically targeting those organizations that, that have the social um, capital, that have that, that commentary that comes against them and can then affect their revenue stream. So for the most part, B to C. And that's as, a, as sort of a, a consequence of our sort of focused approach with that product um, that manifests into the types of organizations that we're seeing. What we are also starting to see as well is um, more specialist broking in the space. So we're starting to see broker um, groups get their own um, you know, change their titles to represent this part of the area that they're they're looking after. Um, equally, you know, they're bringing their skill set from other areas that you know have a crisis component to them into this space. So that's kind of the things that are driving it. The types of organisations we're seeing, um, we see, you know, typically things from manufacturing, retail, media, transportation, leisure and hospitality, and you know, those that you know as they um, recover from impact of COVID, education, technology. And we're seeing those sort of, you know, directly in terms of the organizations themselves looking to improve their risk management. They're looking to have a rounded solution. Um, I don't know if if Tom would agree, but I think what we're starting to see more broadly in the market, not just in the reputational space, is um, the the insurance products that are coming out are more solution orientated rather than just pure indemnity. So um, the types of things that are coming through now have a risk management component, they have access to expertise, which is how that's how ours put together. And that's kind of a, a mantra that's mirroring themselves across the market. Tom, I can see you want to jump in. Yeah. Oh, I'm being asked to poll, but apparently I can't vote because I'm a panelist. Um, so um, no, I, I like that point a lot, actually, Neil. And um there's this sort of there's this societal value to our community that we don't always use in the right way. And I love the fact you've t- touched on the sort of solution element of this in that, you know, oftentimes it's, it's not, it's not entirely about risk transfer. Uh, It's about the kind of range of tools and options that people have at their disposal to manage through a crisis. And it's the relationships that, you know, brokers and insurers can curate that might actually be more helpful than the actual underlying risk transfer. Um, Now, now our model doesn't always cater for that brilliantly, but at the same time, I, I, I do, I do think that's an excellent point. And the other thing I really like you touching on is, is that let's not forget the brokers. And I totally agree with this. 
there are some absolutely fantastic brokers out there who I don't even want to call brokers. They're, 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 they're sort of like super brokers who sort of are able to navigate this space, able to sit down with a client, talk through their real problems, a bit like, you know, going to see um, sort of a specialist consultant for something and actually using, and I've seen this a lot now, I don't know about you, Neil and Harry, but um, I think some of these brokers are now using their own tech and data in quite innovative ways to really kind of evaluate some of these problems. And I think that's a really interesting move. And then the other thing that I've seen is that when we're talking about complexity, what I've seen is I've, I've seen deals done where actually from, from the whole complexity standpoint, reputation is too big a subject, but from asset three in geography A, there's actually a need to protect it from X, Y, Z, and P. And if we did that, then that's actually a brilliant way of solving a bottleneck in our reputation. And that's the sort of thing that we can commercially achieve and why don't we build on that model for the future? So just, just a couple of points on that. Thanks. There'll be more uh, laser focused around um, a solution for a known problem, but also the brokers are helping to identify that problem. And, and, I, and certainly the last thing you want to be doing in the middle of a crisis is arguing whether you have the budget to pay for the expertise. So if it comes bundled with the expertise, then that's just a given and you have it already. Neil, if you want to say something, then you have to make it quick because I do want to get some questions. <laughs> audience but if there are none then we can come straight back i was just going to say i totally agree with tom and and that sort of unique sort of focused approach towards specific revenue streams is something that that we see and we we do do with clients on a regular basis and actually to to that you know that view of risk we also work with pe firms and and look at things from an MA perspective around how mm -hmm. reputation is a concern area so it's something that we see all the time um, the, the sort of the most sophisticated conversations we have are where we're thinking around what's on the balance sheet, you know, in that sort of amorphous area as well, which is a really helpful place to start when um, we're working with brokers, we're working with clients. Anyway, I'll shut up now. Well, you may have a chance to say more. So, Enya, have we any questions in the Q and A? Whilst Enya is. Uh, just working out questions or how to, to put them across, we have the answer to one of the polling questions, which was, uh, which aspect of reputation do your clients find hardest to do? And uh, who is managing the reputation seems to be not difficult at all, which is interesting given um, what Harry's experience is, but it's equally difficult to measure the reputation and to, to work out what um, tools you can use to m monitor it and then potentially mitigate it, which uh, only means that we need to get more time on all of those subjects um, so that, and more expertise so we can answer that better. But it still looks like the um, cyber risk is the, is the top of the poll in terms of if I did have any extra budget to spend, where would I put it? Now, reputation is next. And so we have to help understand the reputation topic a little more so that we can see where actually there is a big overlap between reputation and cyber and reputation and pandemic and reputation and intellectual property. It was a trick question. They are all connected and a damage to any one of those is actually also a damage to your reputation. So Enya, is there anything specific um, in the Q&A or can I go back to the panel? Hey, Tina, it's Mark. There is oh, uh, Mark. A, a question in the chat. Um, what's an accurate approach for assessing an organization's reputational exposure. Neil, do you want to take that? Absolutely. So, I mean, it depends on the on the product structure. So the way that we look at it, and uh, hopefully I'll try and answer one of the other questions in, in the Q&A as well, um, is, is around looking at that exposure as it will have an impact. Now, you might remember that I mentioned when we have a loss of attraction, we have a loss of potentially a loss of revenue. So the way that we, we structure the BC solution is to look at a revenue drop over a period of time following an event. Now, the actual exposure, we're looking to provide coverage for the main chunk of our, of our limit that we're putting out um, on the business interruption side is for loss of operating profit. So that's the way we would start to measure exposure. Now, a key part of what we do and what we're very keen to do is service this product properly is assess the key characteristics that make up that risk. Now, to sort of cover off another question I think that was out there, rather than looking at the incidental coverages, is our product is all risks as a solution with a couple of sort of um, exclusions that will make sense, one of which is cyber, because there's a cyber product market. Um, 
And that's what we do is we'll bucket up the different considerations that we think will drive a reputational crisis and see how that will affect um, an organization. So if we're looking at um, uh, a hotel, things that could affect them from a, a damage by association be very different, different to a fashion brand, for example. So like I said, it's always different in different situations, but applying a, a solid approach and a standardized approach and look at that exposure in terms of the loss of profit, in terms of how the product works, that's how we like to look at it. Sorry, that was a lot of words in a very short space of time, but I know we have a lot of questions. Well, I think connected to something you said before, uh, Jan has asked a question about how can a small organization manage its risk profile to know if something negative is out there affecting its reputation. Um, and, and that unknown is the big one. So uh, can you build on what you were saying around the polecat and the monitoring just to answer Jan's question there? Yeah, sure. And um, it's, a, it's, it's a really good point because reputation is made up of, you know, three different things, known knowns, um, known unknowns, and the unknown unknown that comes out of the dark and, and strikes you and, and uh, ruins, your, ruins your day and may, you know, you lose your job. But um, what the technology is now able to do in, in Polcat and, and other forms is pick up things at a much more granular level than they were ever before. And, and to Tom's, Tom's point earlier, um, cull out the things which aren't relevant. So being able to scan the entire horizon for all the references of all of the brands that an organization has, uh, regardless of size, is a very important factor to monitor. Now, if there's not a lot out there, that's a comment on both your um, on, on the marketing that's being put out, but also on the general perception, which may actually be a positive learning attribute because that might inform the different things you want to do. So there are kind of two angles to the capability that you can get through these kinds of solutions. Um, but it's a great fear. It's a great fear for all of us, as Jan says. Um, but being that the technology is much, much more um, sophisticated than it's ever been before. And on a big this... company level, Harry, do you have an answer to Anthony's question around how do you explain to a, to a large number of staff doing very different things what rest, reputational risk is? That's a great question. You know, that's like the business continuity and, and other training that you do within an organization. Who do you train? How do you train them? Becomes a, a very important question. And I think that organizations that do uh, have a branding program that have trained their people as to who is who are we as an organization? What is the message that we're trying to get out there? What are the kind of activities and things that you should or should not do um, is a very important part of building the overall organization. But unfortunately, there's not a lot of, again, you know, going back to the poll question you asked, if you had additional budget. I think one of the excuses that, or I don't know if excuses is the right word, one of the rationales that we hear a lot for why people, organizations don't do those training programs, they don't build their brand with their own employees. You know, they look at building their brand with the outside with their customer base, but they don't understand that brand is built from the inside. And so, um, again, brand and reputation are a huge issue. Um, when Neil was talking about how you monitor, you know, a lot of organizations have some monitoring in place for monitoring their own personal brand, but they're not necessarily man monitoring the brand of their industry, for example. So, it's almost like, you know, throwing a pebble into a pond. You're that center, but there's so many concentric rings around you that you need to be monitoring for reputation and brand related issues. And you can get hit out of the dark. You know, that unknown unknown doesn't necessarily have to hit your organization specifically. It can hit your industry. And again, most organizations just they don't do, they can't do the internal training um, to have their own people monitoring for that. They do need a polecat or someone like that to be assisting them in that process because it's too big of a process to do on your own. Uh, Tina, are you back? Yeah, I hey, am. Um, thank you. That's not good for my reputation, is it? I assume Harry just talked through that whole gap that I missed. <laughs> Absolutely. You know me, Tina. I mean, that's never going to be a problem. Um, and let me, by, being that I have the floor for one more second, I wanted to comment on something that Tom said about super brokers, because the brokers that are on this call all want to be a super broker. 
that's a brand and reputation issue that we're talking about. And Tom sees some of them as super brokers because they're doing things that are building their brand and reputation. And again, going back to what I had said earlier about sword and shield, no, well, back in the dark ages, when I went to the College of Insurance, you know, the first thing that they taught you was that insurance was a contract of indemnity and that we were going to put the insured back in the same position they were prior to the occurrence through monetary means. Well, the reality is that doesn't work anymore. If you once your brand and reputation have been destroyed, you're not getting it back no matter how much money you get. So those super brokers who are looking holistically at risk and helping their insureds manage risk on an overall basis before, during, and after an event, those are the people who are going to get the business. And those are the people who are going to be viewed by guys like Tom as super brokers. So just before we wrap up, one more thing around capacity, and Tom's already had his two cents on this. So, Neil, do you think that um, there is enough capacity maybe with you as the lead and are there other co-insurers who would follow behind you so you can build a tower or is it still early days? Well, obviously, it, you know, to be honest, we're, we're, we're not like in this, you know, 30, 40 years with capacity fighting for each other. So we, we would obviously like to see more, but we are seeing more come in. Um, where we sit, we sit at the lead of a consortium um, for which we're able to put down a 25 million US dollar or currency equivalent um, line per risk um, on our on our solution. Now, there are other solutions out there with different levels of capacity. But as this grows from year to year, and actually, um, we've had some very positive discussions with other markets, um, you know, facilitated by brokers looking to do things on, you know, excess layers, all that kind of good stuff. So we're starting to see things moving in the right direction. Now, for the types of organizations that are out there, when you have your sort of your mega, enormous, super global organizations, uh, you know, say some of which have had some outages this week, um, you know, the types of the types of capacity that we'd be able to deploy um, as a market at this point probably wouldn't be what they're looking for. However, when you're looking at organizations that have a really outsized brand to the type of uh, you know revenue and the, the profit that they're able to generate, those are the companies that really need that the most because they're the ones that require the, the rounded solution that has that ability to monitor the access to the experts when things really start to go wrong. So cheeky, so cheeky the, question, cheeky yeah, question then, Neil. Um, assuming you didn't write Facebook, would you have paid the loss <laughs> over the last couple of days? Well, my uh, our product has a cyber exclusion, um, so that, that probably helps us. So the reason we've done that, by the way, for everyone on the call is because it's a very well established uh, and prolific and, um, you know, expert cyber market. So have I lost contact again? Or? No, you haven't. You're just interrupting Neil now. <laughs> That's a great time to interrupt me. <laughs> Sorry, I wish I'd had that answer. My internet seems to be unstable. So I think um, now would be a great time for me to wrap up. And then uh, I'm sure Annie has a last couple of things to say. Um, what I would say is thank you for the questions. Thank you for being interested in telling us what you want to hear more about. And we will work to bring that to you, some further sessions around those other topics and with expertise of different types. So tune in again. You'll see the adverts coming from Lloyd's. Thank you again, Tina. Thank you, Tom, Harry, and Neil for your expert uh, insight, which is super helpful. Uh, as you guys can hear, this is a very complex risk. It's not that simple, uh, yet is not very much understood by the audience and by many of us. So this is only the beginning of a conversation that we want to start with, with the audience. And um, you, you can tell Mark just put the email contact with all the speakers in the chat box. So please follow up with the speakers, follow up with our audience as, as well. If you have any questions, any thoughts, please share. And I do challenge each one in the audience please think about yourself as a super broker or a super risk manager because the, the risk is evolving. It's no longer just a simple risk transfer or any other simple solutions anymore. We're living in a world of, of ever-changing risk landscape and solutions need to be more complex and more thoughtful. Uh, with that, I, I want to invite you guys to join us again in a week. We have a showcase of Syndicate coming up next Tuesday. That'll be MS Amlin featuring the Johannes Labert, CEO, and Andrew Carrier, CEO of MS Amlin coming up next week. Uh, in between, let's stay connected and uh, stay tuned. Thank you again, everyone.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you Thanks all so much. much.